infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, hey everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. Now, earlier this week, the Pennsylvania government warned the public that as the weather gets warmer and you spend more time outdoors, you got to be aware of ticks and Lyme disease. Now, Pennsylvania has reported the ticks that carry Lyme disease and other infectious agents in all 67 of their counties. And year after year, they report at or near the top of all states in cases of Lyme disease. And it's not just Pennsylvania. Lyme disease cases continue to rise across the country. Now, in today's podcast, I want to look at the ecology and ticks. My guest today is disease ecologist with the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies, Richard Ostfeld, Ph.D. Dr. Ostfeld, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you very much, Robert. Okay, well, as I mentioned in the intro, ticks and Lyme disease are progressively becoming a bigger and bigger problem in the U.S. So in summary, why are ticks and tick-borne diseases on the rise? Well, ticks and tick-borne diseases are increasing for a variety of reasons. They, they exist in a complex system with a lot of different species that interact. The ticks, the pathogens that make us sick, um, lots of different species of hosts that the ticks feed on and get infected from, the landscapes in which all those species exist, um, and then, of course, humans and human behavior. So there are a lot of moving parts. Um, a couple of the reasons why tick-borne disease has been getting worse and worse is that the range of the tick, the geographic range, is expanding. Um, that is due in part to climate warming, but there have to be other factors involved as well, and we don't understand them uh, as well as climate change. As the climate warms, um, the growing season increases in its length. So uh, the cold weather comes later and later in the year, and that's great for ticks and not so great for us because it gives the ticks a little bit longer uh, period of time to find a host. Um, they need to find a host to drink that host's blood, uh, and that's the only thing they ever eat. And if they fail to find a host, they die. So if they have another few weeks, maybe another month to seek a host, it's warm enough for them to be active, um, then they're more likely to survive. Tick populations are more likely to establish, and then the ticks can grow into areas that were formerly just too cold. Um, we also know that climate warming is making the ticks come out earlier and earlier in the year uh, so that now they can, they, the nymph stage, the most dangerous stage, can come out as early as um, early to mid-May, whereas a couple of decades ago it was more like early June. We also know that um, our the human activities that degrade or fragment the forests, chopping up continuous forest into little bits, um, helps the ticks to thrive. And the way that it does that um, is by favoring certain hosts for the ticks, especially things like white-footed mice and eastern chipmunks. Um, those animals thrive when we reduce mammal and bird diversity, which we do by chopping up and degrading forest, um, a lot of their predators and competitors decline or disappear and the mice just go to town. The mice are super important in the ecology of tick-borne disease because they are a really great host for the tick. Uh, ticks like to feed on mice. They survive well when they feed on mice and chipmunks. Um, and they also acquire those infectious agents that you mentioned at a high rate. So a combination of climate warming and habitat destruction by humans uh, is at least in part responsible for that spread across mm -hmm. the country and up into high elevations and colder places. Sure. So you've, uh, you've checked on um, land use. You've talked about climate change. How about the wildlife um, 
um, and I'd like to ask you about opossums in particular. Uh, what what is their role in this um, tick-borne situation? It's a positive one, right? It is. You know, of all these uh, different species, uh, only a few of which I've mentioned, um, there are some that are kind of villains and others that are more like heroes. And the opossums would be one of the heroes. Um, what they do is they do their opossum thing. They, you know, wander around on the forest floor um, and in fields and even in backyards. And the ticks will attempt to feed on them. So the ticks are, are sitting there in the vegetation waiting for some mammal or bird to come by. If it's an opossum, they'll climb on board the opossum and attempt to take their blood meal to feed on the opossum. But opossums, it turns out, um, are really good groomers. And they don't look it, but they're actually quite fastidious. We've determined this by experimental studies in the field and the lab. And so opossums kill thousands of ticks that are attempting to feed on them um, and they do that far more effectively than any other of the hosts that we've studied. So we've estimated that a single opossum during the peak period of um, the baby ticks, the larvae, in the middle of summer, an individual opossum can kill a few thousand ticks per week. Uh, and that's a really good thing for us. So that's why at the Cary Institute we give out or sell bumper stickers that say, I break for opossums. Ask me why with uh, our URL on the on the bumper sticker. Yeah, and uh, something else that uh, is part of the whole tick puzzle, and something you've written about uh, pretty extensively, is um, acorns and the quantity of acorns. Can you elaborate on that? Yes. So, um, so right. So the opossums are our heroes, as I was saying, and the white-footed mice and chipmunks are kind of the villains, um, you know, take that with a grain of salt. There, there are positive, you know, valuable things that mice and chipmunks do in our ecosystems as well. But with respect to tick-borne disease, they are responsible for boosting tick populations and infecting ticks with these tick-borne pathogens, not just Lyme, but also the agents of babesiosis and anaplasmosis, two other uh, expanding tick-borne um, diseases. And so if there are a lot of mice in any given summer when these baby ticks are active, then ticks have a high probability of feeding on a mouse, high probability of surviving and getting infected and turning into a dangerous infected nymph stage tick uh, the next year. So um, more mice means more Lyme disease risk to us a little bit later on. Well, so what determines how many mice there are crawling around in the woods? Um, the, the, the answer to that is essentially acorns, at least in, in areas where there are oak-dominated forests, which consists of a lot of the Northeast, some of the upper Midwest. Um, and so acorns are a really high-quality food resource for mice and various other wildlife. Um, they have, they're full of protein and lipids. They have a good shelf life. They can be stored and eaten all winter long. And if there's a good acorn year, um, in the fall, the mice, uh, mouse population becomes really, really abundant the next summer. Um, our oak trees, like many other trees, um, produce occasional bumper crops of seeds, in this case acorns. Um, and, but most years, they just trickle out a few acorns or don't produce really any at all. So as go the acorns, so go the mice. As go the mice, so go the infected ticks and our risk of exposure. So we can actually do a decent job of predicting how risky a year it's going to be um, based on acorn production almost two years earlier. Mm -hmm. So acorns are a good leading indicator of Lyme disease risk. Yeah, I always find that so so fascinating. Okay, so we looked at climate change, acorns, land use, um, wildlife. Is there any other ecological factor that I've missed? Well, you know those there those are all um, those are all intertwined. 
what we're seeing is, um, in addition to this black-legged tick, the, the one that transmits Lyme disease, babesiosis, anaplasmosis, another important issue is that there are a couple of other ticks that are acting like invasive species. So the Lone Star tick is now uh, rapidly expanding its range. This could be due to climate change as well. That has not been as well studied. Um, and we don't know what's going to happen as the Lone Star tick continues to move into areas that it hasn't occurred in before. They can transmit um, uh, ehrlichiosis, and they also can cause people to develop a really potent allergic reaction, even anaphylaxis, um, uh, after the consumption of red meat. Right. Um, and so that's of great concern. And then we have a new invader um, from far away uh, called the, the longhorned tick that's a native to Eastern Asia. It invaded uh, New Zealand in the past several decades, and now it's present in Eastern North America. Whether it's going to become a public health problem, we don't know yet, but it appears to be rapidly expanding as well. Yeah. Okay. When I was on your website, I saw a link to something called the Tick Project. I want to give you a chance to talk about that. Right. So, you know, I've spent about the past 25, 26 years studying the ecology of tick-borne disease um, in natural habitats. And my main goal in doing that work is to try to understand this system better and better all the time. It's, uh, it's essentially basic research. We're trying to improve our understanding of how nature works. In recent years, um, I've, try, I've expanded that effort into a much more applied research where I'm actually trying now to solve the problem of tick-borne disease. Apply that understanding that we've gained um, with a lot of hard work over a couple of decades to reducing um, tick born disease incidents in our community. This is work with Felicia Keesing at Bard College. So the Tick Project is an attempt to reduce numbers of cases of tick-borne disease in entire communities, in neighborhoods. This is done in Dutchess County, New York, in the Hudson Valley, where we're using two tick-killing methods that are both well-tested, known to be environmentally safe and safe for people, pets, children, uh, in the environment, um, but we're deploying them to aggressively kill ticks at the level of entire neighborhoods, and we're following up both ecologically, we're collecting ticks, we're trapping the mice and seeing how many ticks are on them, but we're also following up with all the participants in the study to determine how frequently they are encountering, encountering ticks on themselves, on their pets, um, and also how frequently they're getting diagnosed with tick-borne disease. So it's a five-year-long study. We're um, in the middle of it. We don't have um, results to be able to report yet, but we're optimistic that what we're going to be able to do is to design and test a means of controlling our exposure to tick-borne disease in a way that's safe for us in the environment. Excellent, excellent. And let me go ahead and close out the interview with uh, uh, this last um chance to give you a, uh, a moment to talk about the work of the Cary Institute. Right. Well, the Cary Institute is um, kind of an unusual place in that we're one of relatively few private, nonprofit ecological research institutes in the country or even in the world. So we're not affiliated with um, a university or any other entity. Although we, we are a little bit like uh, an ecology department at a university without the university around us. So we have, you know, about 15 or 16 PhD level ecologists. We study everything from the Hudson River to the ecology of cities to eastern forests, savannas, um, uh, climate change, and, and we have a strong education program as well. Um, so we are providing the science behind solutions to environmental problems of, of, a, of a variety of colors and shades. Well, good stuff. And for listeners that want to learn more about the Cary Institute or the Tick Project, I will put uh, links on the show notes portion of the uh, podcast so you can check that out. 
And I want to thank you, Dr. Rick Osfeld, for your time and your expertise, and uh, keep up the great work, sir. Well, my pleasure. Thanks. Thank you very much for the great questions.